free epiglottic muscle and also the enteroerythroid muscles the second one is the ventricular bands which come together adduction that is approximation occurs leading to contraction of the adductors causes adduction of the vocal cords the three sphincters primarily acts on the production the next part is partially they act is the laryngeal elevation by mylo hyoid muscle laryngeal tilt by the stylopharyngeus cricopharynx sphincter will relax slowly there is a cessation of respiration and uh, if any contents are there there will be a cough reflex epiglottis has very less role in the lower respiratory tract production the next function is the phonation occurs at the time of inspiration only it starts vocal cords approximated following adduction the air escapes through this space causes vibration of the vocal cords the vibratory tone is articulated by lips gums teeth and tongue palate and jaws they are further resonated by the pharynx nasal oral cavities and also the paranasal sinuses the pitch of the voice is proportional to the number of vocal cord vibrations per second the length and intensity of the intensity the volume of the voice determined by the lung capacity duration and intensity of the voice depends upon the respiratory bellows and subglottic pressure build up by adduction of the vocal cords pitch depends also on the vibratory mass of the vocal cords the power of the laryngeal adductors and also the tensors quality and timbre depends upon the resonators and the articulators of the speech the phonation is descri described in six aspects that is the biomechanics of phonation characteristics of the sound and source glottal signal modification of the glottal signal vocal resonance fundamentals of speech that is our articulation paralinguistic features of the voice and the speech in biomechanics of phonation at rest there will be at rest and quiet respiration vocal folds abduct on inspiration and slightly adduct on expiration larynx descends on inspiration ascends on expiration the phonation biomechanics is divided into initiation of the voice movement of the vocal folds vibratory cycle that is what we call vocal resistance initiation of voice occurs in different phases pre phonatory phase vocal folds rapidly abduct to allow the air into the lungs they take inside layer then generation of the vocal known by adduction of the vocal fold by cricoerythroid contraction which causes vocal fold oscillation that is a repeated vibratory movement of the vocal fold this development of phonation threshold pressure will increase subglottic air pressure increase by below the adducted vocal fold until to blow the vocal cords apart that is abduction phonation occurs in abduct vocal fold vibrates depends upon the degree of inertia that is what you call pressure loudness of the voice that is called intensity depends upon the expiratory force vocal folds vibrates in normal conversation 100 to 300 hz in males normally 100 cycles per second in females 200 cycles per second in children 250 
thing, same goes, it starts from the inferior only, but not in the superior, and slowly the closure will be at the end is the superior aspect. The periodic vocal fold contact and lack of contraction type is the vibratory cycle. During closing, that is the phase, vocal fold begins to close rapidly from the lower margin. That is what you have seen in the picture. Closed medial edges of the vocal folds will come into full contact. In the opening, vocal fold begins to separate from the lower margin gradually peel apart. Superior margin remains in contact until the end of this phase. Vocal folds are separated at the opening. This is the longest phase of the cycle. Glottic insufficiency, insufficient approximation of the vocal folds will occur in case of air wastage leak or breathy wise. Post-glottal chink, Insufficient closure of the posterior part of the glottis, commonly seen in young and middle-aged women, that also will change the voice. The quality of the glottic source characteristics depends upon vibratory characteristics of the laryngeal structures, nature of vocal fold adduction during phonation, Regularity of the mucosal waves of the lamina propria. Breathy wise due to incomplete adduction of vocal fold. Insufficient add to achieve vibration, but insufficient to produce audible turbulent here. It is whisper. It is insufficient add to achieve a vibration, but sufficient adduction to produce audible turbulent airflow will produce that whisper. Hoarseness of the voice, it is a irregular mucosal wave from vibration resulting a periodic, a periodic sound. Noise, a periodic sound, not a harmonic of the glottal signal. Breathy voice, whisper and hoarseness, noise. <coughs> Frequency, determined by result of vibratory cycles. Function of vocal fold length, elasticity, sentence, mass, and resistance to subglottic air pressure. The pitch is proportional or correlate with the frequency of the vibration of the vocal cord. Pitch registers are observed. You see the loft register, it is called highest vocal frequencies. Model registers range of fundamental frequencies most commonly used in speaking and singing. Pulse register, lowest range of vocal frequencies. Laryngeal output is perceived in pulse style as uh, ear. The equivalent term some people use salsetto for the loft registers. Heavy voice for the model registers. Creaky voice or fry voice in the pulse registers. This is a thin loft register, thin, tense, lengthened, minimal vibration will occur in the vocal folds. In model register, complete adduction will occur. The long closed phase, which we described in the vibratory cycle, occurs in the pulse register. These are different uh, uh, things, uh, those who like to sing, uh, those who are professional singers, celebrated, they will know that all these details. The amplitude of the voice. Vocal loudness is proportional to the voice amplitude. The size of the oscillation of the vocal fold is very important here. It is determined by the force of transglottic airflow. Modification of the glottic signal is done by vocal tract, larynx, and pharynx, nasal cavities, mouth, and lips. Formation of sound waves will come as the result of the rapidly repeating cycle of opening and closing at the glottis. 
release of small puffs of air from subglottic air column which form sound waves here the vocal folds produce only intensity of pitch of the sound it is later modified by various resonating chambers above and below the vocal resonance divided into oral resonance affected by nasal resonance affected by oral resonance degree of the jaw movement the mouth opening how much the mouth is open tongue body rising and pharyngeal muscle contractions the size of the pharyngeal opening also will change the voice nasal resonance is affected by excessive or too limited action of the balopharyngeal sphincter normally but uh, what you see in the rhinolalia glaza and apatha some pathological conditions also will change the voice the fundamentals of speech articulation vocal sound is modified from the source filtered by the articulatory movements and it turns into the speech the articulatory movements will produce different things that is one is the vowels and consonants the vowels no obstruction to the flow of air will occur the flow from the larynx to the lips there is a continuous flow which will produce the vowels consonants require more definite obstruction that means the articulation is very very important in production of the consonants here vowel production depends upon by changing the height of the tongue raising in the mouth tongue takes a primary part and the part of the tongue which is raised is it the front part or a center part or the back part of the tongue the position of the limbs the lips some whether they are spread or rounded then the vowels will change different vowels will come consonant distinction made by three main elements place manner and state place of articulation whether the sound modified from the lips and alveoli area manner manner of articulation that is they are plosive or fricative we'll describe further the state of the larynx is it a voiced or a voiceless place manner and state place of articulation and you discuss and production of sound if they are bilabial then the example bilabial consonants are p and b they you need articulation of the lip and alveolar here p and b labio dental then here comes the f and v you need a limb and also the dental area f and v only dental you articulation is important that is a th just like in the think and that a th sound is produced by dental particularly those who doesn't have a teeth they will have a disarticulation here palatal is the y Y is very important, uh, and that unless the tongue touches the palate, the Y will not be produced. And here, important is whenever there is a palatal problem, the Y sound will be different. Velar, that is soft palate area, important 
the letters like K, G, where the velar importance movement of the velar part is important to produce the K and G consonants. Glottal. Glottis is very important. Whenever they, you wanted to spell H, H refers to the glottal area. The manner of articulation, which I told you, plosive and fricative, they are uh, how the air flows in obstructed in oral tract. Five categories of consonants are described. The number one is the plosive, fricatives, affricates, nasals, and approximant. Plosive consonants. The air is completely compressed behind the point of articulation and then released with an audible noise. This is what you will see in the P and P. The air is completely compressed behind the point of articulation and then released with an audible noise. Those are called the plosive consonant. Fricatives. There is a continuous consonants continue for a long time. Air hissing through the close approximation of the two articulators. That type of consonants are called fricative consonant. Continued consonants. Air hissing through the close approximation of the two articulators. Continue for a long time. These called the fricative consonants. The examples are F, Z, S. Affricates consonant begin with the plosive and the end with the fricative. Affricates consonants are begin with plosive above and end with fricative. Like uh, examples are Ch. DJ, church, JJ. These areas, when you say ch, j, this area are called affricates, consonants. Nasal consonants. Air escapes through the nose. The air prevented passing through the mouth by obstructive lip and tongue. Soft palate is lowered to allow the nasal air escape. Normally, normal sound, we say nasal consonant. When uh, more space is created, we call this as a rhinolalia aperta. In soft palate paralysis and also in cases of a, uh, palatal perforations and the palatal defects, congenital defects, then uh, you will call, you will uh, See this rhinolalia aperta. The air escapes through the nose, prevented passing through the mouth by obstruction of the lip and tongue. The soft palate lowered to allow the nasal air escape. Inadequate valopharyngeal competence results in inappropriate nasalization. That's what I do. Rhinolalia aperta. Approximate consonant. When articulators not sufficiently closed to produce a complete consonant. Approximate consonants are when articles not sufficiently close to produce complete consonant. Articulated similarly to vowels here, the semi-vowels what we call is I and Y. I and Y is the semi-vowels. They are articulated similar to the vowels, but they are consonants. Next, you should know voiced and voiceless consonant. Consonant plus no vocal vibration. These are, these are called voiceless consonants. Consonant plus no vocal vibration is, is called voiceless consonants. Example, P. T, K. Here there is not, not much vocal vibration is there. Consonant 
plus vocal vibration is important. In cases that those are called voiced consonant. Voiced consonant example B, D and G. You see here voiced consonant means consonant with vocal vibration should be there. Voiceless consonant means consonant plus no vocal vibration. This example voiceless are P, T, K. Voiced one is the B, D and G. There is vocal vibration. If you put your hand on the larynx, you can differentiate both the things. Paralinguic features of the speech. It depends upon the speech rhythm, speech rate, accent, vocal intonation. Speech rhythm depends on integral part of the early childhood, speech, voice, language, communication development and speech motor control system. It is what we call speech rhythm. It is an integral part of early childhood speech, voice and language and communication development. Speech motor control systems act here. This is very, very important. That's why we have to train the, starting from the, in the childhood, the speech should be corrected. If you don't correct, it won't be later corrected well. The importance is here. The speech rate depends on reflect our state of arousal. See, excited or drowsy or stressed. Depending upon our state of arousal, the speech rate depends. Those who are excited, they speak fast, drowsy. They speak slowly, stressed one, you will have a that is how the, you can identify the state of the mind of the patient by speech. It is an indicator of anxiety also. Too fast, it shows it may be anxiety. Low intellectual, too slow, low intellect fellow will speak slowly. Linked to psychological variable also, such as pulse respiratory rate. Depending upon the pulse respiratory rate also, the speech differs. The accent, regional accent demands a different speech rhythms. Nowadays in the pictures, you are seeing different types of speech accents. Telangana accent, popular, Tamil Nadu, like Hindi and English, and the Hindi and Telugu, the different accents is the regional accent. This is the training of uh, areas, very important. The identity of the locals from other areas, you can identify with the accent, what is the area the patient has come from. Vocal intonation, it indicates the communicative intent. Question or certainty of the statement by use of the varying vocal pitch to indicate various grammatical and psychological other statements. This intonation depends upon the community intent. That is what you question and answer or certainty in the statement. By use of the varying vocal pitch to indicate the various grammatical, psychological, other statements. In the conclusion, the voice is the product of vibrating vocal folds combined with the resonating of the sound throughout the vocal tract. The specific characteristics of individual speech and voice are the product of the organ and phonetic features of the speaker. The quality of the chaotic sound is wholly dependent upon the vibratory characteristics of the laryngeal structures. Orchestrated movements of the organs of articulation modify the vocal sound into a recognizable speech. Paralinguist features of the voice and speech, including speech and stress, accent, and vocal intonation are observed. That is the physiology of the phonation, I mean larynx, 
Coming to the anatomy and physiology of the tracheobronchial tree. In the third week of intrauterine life, a median groove develops in the floor of primitive foregut. That groove is called tracheobronchial sulcus. This elongates rostrocaudally slowly and a tracheal esophageal septum develops in between. At the fourth week, the pulmonary primordium of the caudal end of the sulcus develops into left and right lung buds. Left and right lung buds, the fourth week. The pulmonary development, rostrum to caudal, that is the larynx to lungs will occur. That further in the lungs, the primary bronchus to secondary bronchi, slowly it develops. This is the larynx trachea you are seeing. You are seeing here is the superior laryngeal nerve, which come from the vagus. Another one is here, you are seeing vagus. Again, there is a recurrent laryngeal nerve. This is the left recurrent laryngeal nerve, curves below the arch of the aorta. But uh, here, uh, it is going, it is not going up to the arch of right? the difference between both recurrent laryngeal And you are seeing the thyroid gland, and it is supplied by superior thyroid artery. And this is by in the inferior thyroid artery. And you are seeing this is the larynx, thyroid, cartilage, tracheal cartilage, and tracheal wings. The trachea is not a totally cartilaginous tube, it is a membrana cartilaginous tube. It extends from the lower border of the cricoid cartilage at C6. Extends downwards up to thoracic fifth vertebra at the level of upper border, upper border of the thoracic fifth vertebra from the lower border of the cricoid. The length of the trachea is about 10 to 11.5 centimeters. The width is about 2 to 2.0 centimeters. The width is more in males than in females and children. This is very important uh, whenever you see and you perform the tracheostomies. The total trachea consists of 16 to 20 incompletely having a ring made up of hyaline cartilage. It is deficient, the ring is deficient posteriorly. The each ring is 4 mm width and 1 mm thick. Rings kept between two fibrous layers with trachealis muscle in between. That means the rings are sandwiched between two layers of the fibrous layers and it has a trachealis muscle in between. It is lined by ciliated columnar epithelium. Relations of the trachea in the neck. Anteriorly, you are having a strap muscles that is uh, sternothyroid, sternohyoid. Those are the trap, strap muscles will cover anteriorly. The isthmus of the thyroid gland is present at uh, two, three, four tracheal rings. Isthmus. This is important uh, whenever you do the thyroid surgery. Two superior thyroid arteries will give branches which will anastomose anteriorly. The anastomotic vessels also present anteriorly. The innominate and the left brachiocephalic vein are 
at the lower part of the neck, they come into the anterior position. Innominate vein and left brown brachiocephalic vein at lower part of the neck will come in position to the trachea. Laterally, you are having the loops of the thyroid up to the sixth ring normally. Then carotid, I mean, the common carotid is also placed laterally. Inferior jugular vein also placed laterally and also the vagus nerve. Inferior thyroid artery, sorry, vagus nerve, both uh, these uh, all things will come laterally. One is the lobe of thyroid, second one is the common carotid artery, inferior jugular artery and from common carotid you will get inferior thyroid also. And uh, it leads to the, I mean also vagus nerve is present. Posteriorly, you are having a membranous part is closely related with the use of agus. The recurrent laryngeal nerve, posteriorly, it is not perfectly in the lateral, it go more posterolateral. In trachea usophageal group, this is the area you should take care whenever you do any surgery for the thyroid or the larynx or larynx or planning of tracheostomy also very important. The blood supply is from the inferior thyroid artery for the trachea and venous supply is from the thyroid venous plexus. The nerves related to trachea is the recurrent laryngeal nerve. The tracheal bifurcation is important because whenever we do any surgical procedures or like uh, uh, thyroid, I mean thyroid and lifting of the trachea upwards. And second one is when you do the bronchoscopies, you should aware where the trachea divides and how the main bronchus and segmental bronchi are there. Now we are having uh, still more sophisticated optical forceps and optical scopes, fibro optical, flexible fibro optical scope. So, where you can observe the segmental bronchi very clearly. Coming to trachea, it bifurcates at the upper border of the T5, thoracic vertebra upper border. From trachea, it divides into two main bronchus. It is 25 centimeters length from incisa to the carina. Carina is a chill like spur produced and modified from the lowest tracheal ring. It is a modified uh, tracheal cartilage. It is like a keel divides into two the main trachea. The right bronchus is wider and short and more vertical than the left bronchus. You should be aware that the foreign body in the trachea mostly goes into the right bronchus. Why it goes? Because it is more wider. The length of the bronchus is short, more vertical. Wider and vertical is very important. In the right bronchus. It's a right bronchus. You should be. Left bronchus is more obliquely and horizontally placed and goes more posteriorly. It is more oblique and horizontal and it goes more posteriorly. Right bronchus is wider, shorter and more vertical than left bronchus. Left bronchus is oblique, horizontally placed and goes more posterior as well. The right main bronchus divides further into right upper lobe bronchus, right middle lobe bronchus, right lower lobe bronchus, upper, middle and lower lobe bronchus. They further divided right upper lobe bronchus further divides into one 
the apical segmental bronchi to the posterior segmental bronchi another one is the anterior segmental bronchi it will produce uh, three segmental bronchi in right from right upper lobe bronchus right middle lobe bronchus produce medial segmental bronchi and the two the second one is the lateral segmental bronchi. it is lateral and medial right middle lobe bronchus right lower lobe bronchus produce an apical segmental bronchi medial basal segmental bronchi sub apical segmental bronchi and three basal bronchi that is posterior lateral and anterior it is almost giving uh, six uh, further totally uh, six segmental bronchi are produced this is how the right brain bronchus divides and this each segmental bronchi further divides as you know the peripheral bronchi and all the left main bronchus divides into the left upper lobe bronchus left lower lobe bronchus as you know the left lung is a smaller than the right lung because the position of the heart will take the area left lung is smaller it has only two main bronchi in divided lower bronchi that is the left upper lobe bronchus left lower lobe bronchus the left upper lobe bronchus divides into the apical segmental bronchi two posterior segmental bronchi three anterior segmental bronchi and four lingual segmental bronchi the left lobe bronchus divides into one apical two sub apical three basal bronchi the anterior basal lateral basal and posterior basal after the advent of this flexible scopes and also the endoscopes the bronchi study has gone further and we were there there are not so much are described but now we are having so many left lower bronchus produces apical segmental bronchi sub apical segmental bronchi basal bronchi that divides basal bronchi into anterior basal lateral basal and posterior bronco pulmonary segments of the lungs ventilated by these corresponding segmental bronchi each pulmonary segmental segment is is supplied or ventilated by these corresponding segmental bronchi these are important whenever they do the segmental resection of the lung in cases of uh, what you call uh, bronchiectasis and also in the malignancies the each terminal bronchi is less than 1 mm in diameter each terminal bronchi ventilates an alveolus alveolus and capillaries take main part in the exchange of the gases oxygen carbon dioxide in the blood terminal bronchi is less than 1 mm each ventilates an alveolus alveolus and capillaries take main part in the gases exchange inspiration air flow from the larynx to alveoli is a active process expiration from alveoli to upper airway is a pass passive process tracheobronchial tree safe due to three functions one is the laryngeal protection already we discussed when you discussed in the primary functions of the larynx three sphincter system that is one protection taken case of laryngeal tracheo bronchial tree and next one is the mucociliary system and the cough reflex these three mechanisms will protect the tracheo bronchial tree you can see you all know the 
these bronchi are lined with pseudo stratified columnar epithelium they are rich in uh, mucus glands and goblet cells bronchioles developed of mucus glands and cilia move the mucus blanket towards the larynx it is drained into the pharynx and later it is swallowed mucus is rich in macrophages and the lysosomes kill macro microorganisms here they are very powerful lysosomes are there they kill the microorganisms in the air then further it is accepted it is protected by a cough it is, it is a forced expression again it is closed with glottis it is a neural reflex it helps to clear the irritant and allergic and infective mucus into the pharynx to swallow this is one very important you should know many people they complain of something is coming from the uh, lower part of the that is laryngopharynx regularly those who are sensitive are psychological they think this type of clearance is also a pathological one that's why it is very important to counsel the patient that uh, this is a normal mechanism what you will get into the mouth is a normal one because uh, the thing which gives a bad smell they want to spit it out but uh, the thing which feels sweet they will swallow it but the mucus is the same that's why this psychological reflex is also very important many people they come thinking that this is a pathological condition the dead space here the amount of air flow regulated by neural control it is an incomplete cartilage ring expand you know the dead space where there is no gas exchange occur it starts from the larynx to the uh, terminal bronchi it is about and uh, 500 uh, cc the amount of air flow regulated from is by a neural control and you all know that there is a incomplete cartilaginous rings expand when in demand you know there is a membrane the part in the trachea when there is demand it can expand the mechanism of breathing inspiration it is a present gradient developed by rib cage and also the inspiratory muscles and the diaphragm expiration is by intra alveolar pressure higher than the atmospheric pressure that's why i told it is a passive process mostly intra alveolar pressure is higher than atmospheric pressure the diaphragm which is innervated by phrenic nerve is the main one to develop negative intrathoracic pressure it pulls down and creates negative intrathoracic pressure intercostal muscles which are innervated by intercostal nerves from t1 to t12 also will take contribute in where there is a strain of respiration the accessory muscles of the respiration sternocleidomastoid scalenius also come into the action as i told you expression is a quiet one you don't identify expression is it a, it is a passive process it is an active process when you do the exercise where there is abdominal muscle start to act when you do the exercise and you have a anxiety the active process of expression also identified by person that in the respiration both voluntary and uh, involuntary factors are there respiratory center is present at the floor of the fourth ventricle regulated by the chemoreceptors these chemoreceptors overridden by voluntary control of the cortex in breath holding panting and sighing respiratory centers are overridden by voluntary control by cortex in breath holding when you hold the breath panting and sighing neurons which are dorsally present they are inspiratory they fire automatically 
non cell neurons are inspiratory they fire automatically ventral neurons are expiratory fire only at the time of forced expiration that's why inspiration is a conscious one vent but uh, ventral one only forced one and there is a forced expiration this ventral neurons will start to work you should know there is one center called apneotic center this apneotic center enhances inspiration <clears throat> this is important when you are having a when you study a patient with a sleep apnea syndrome this apneotic center is stimulated and later again the patient goes into the inspiration pneumotoxic centers where there is a suspicion of the poisonous gases and all they terminate inspiration by dorsal neurons here chemo receptors of csf that is hydrogen ion concentration comes carbon dioxide diffusion from the blood through the from the blood that is arterial blood through the passing brain blood brain barrier these chemo receptors pass through the blood brain barrier from the arterial blood into the csf these will give stimulate the respiration peripheral receptors in carotid and aortic bodies also act by falling oxygen tension in profound hypoxia less than 8k per rt measure or 60 mm of mercury in high altitudes this peripheral receptors also starts to work also in chronic pcvo2 elevation impaired central receptor sensitivity also play a role the plasma bicarbonate when it is elevated these central receptor sensitivity is impaired that is very important when you observe in the poisonous gases in tracheostomy and tracheobronchial toileting pathophysiology of understanding is very essential because uh, it is it should be maintained uh, these oxygen levels uh, and you do the tracheostomy because otherwise you will end up with uh, troubles in tracheostomy tracheobronchial lymphatics are pre and the para tracheal nodes these the lymphatics uh, end up in the pre and para tracheal lymph nodes and we are having at the lower level tracheobronchial nodes at the level of hilum of the lung we are having the ilar nodes these lymphatics drain into these nodes and whenever there is a carcinoma or whatever pathology like tuberculosis you will identify nowadays because we are having cts also pet scans also these pre and para tracheal nodes tracheo bronchial nodes and hilar nodes are involved and you can identify the disease involved in that particular patient thank you